Okay. Welcome to the Spirit of Prophecy Church Bible Study, the early five minutes of it. We'll start at 6.30 at 6.25 right now. So uh, this is your chance to send me a question where I can actually read it, and look at it, and maybe answer the question. Um, I also want to say that we received a few complaints today, which normally we never do. Uh, and that was about us talking about the remote viewers. You have to understand that, you know, just like Moses went in and threw the snake down before Pharaoh, and probably Moses was thinking that the Pharaoh and his enchantment people, his wizards, couldn't do the same. But they also threw down their staffs, and they also became snakes. So we Christians want to think that the devil is powerless. He's not. It's just that Jesus has given us power and authority over all of the power of the enemy. We're all serpents and scorpions and nothing by any means shall hurt us. So we have more power through the blood of Jesus, but the devil has power. And I wanted to put that on the program which aired today. If you've not seen it, I think it's a very good program. As a matter of fact, also got a lot of compliments on it too. Um, I think that some people just won't hear it from God's prophets. My thought was, maybe they'll hear it from the secular side. And normally we would never listen to these cut type people. And we didn't. We didn't get any information from them we didn't already know. Just a confirmation. Well, that's good because maybe there's some people that will listen to that, that won't listen to God's prophets. Uh, Binyamin, I see you out there. Shalom, my brothers and sisters. Okay, okay, okay. Alabama. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else is there to talk about? I think, going back to the same subject, I think that there is a very real possibility that the suitcase nukes could, in fact, go off latter part of this year, early part of next year. I do not know that that's going to happen. God has not told me. Uh, I keep asking, <laughs> asking God a lot of questions, and seldom are my questions answered. But if I had my way about it, I'd have a red phone to the throne, and I'd have a lot of questions because I would like to tell you a lot of things. But God holds his secrets to his heart pretty close. And it is hard to get a secret out of God. He, he looks at it this way. I wrote the word, read my book. And I will tell you anything else you need other than that. So uh, I do think we're close. I also think that the new financial system that's coming in, which is probably related to the arrests and the internal revolution. And according to what Jason Meeks was shown in a dream, that that is also associated with suitcase nukes going off. In other words, when they start the arrests, when they switch to the new financial system, the quantum financial system, as some are calling it, then that's probably, I hope, We've got six months between that time and the suitcase nukes. But I don't know. Um, I just don't know. But believe me, if God will tell me, I will tell you. <laughs> I just can't get him to talk to me enough. I guess you probably feel the same way. Ah, Zelina Bronco. I watch you every evening when I do my Bible studies. Explaining everything. Okay, good. Well, let me let me just give credit where credit's due. I'm just a barking dog, and all I do is regurgitate the things that the Lord has spoken to me through the years. All praise, honor, and glory go to Jesus, because that's I, I honestly believe that when Jesus returns, first thing will happen is we if you're on the earth, and I don't plan to be on the earth. I plan to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if you're on the earth, then you'll see the heavens roll back like a scroll. You'll look up and you'll see darkness. Coming out of that darkness 
will be a white horse with Jesus on it. He does not hold up a sword. The sword comes out of his mouth, out of his nose, and it is he is the bright morning star. Behind him are two angels with two sharp sickles. Behind that are the armies in heaven. Behind that are the people that are coming from the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's where you and I want to be. We want to be behind Jesus, watching him use the morning star. And as the morning star hits the earth, it cleanses the earth of all sin. And in that moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, is when we get all of our mantles, our rewards, our crowns, everything. And we become eternal. Out of our belly flows rivers of living water. And then after we become eternal, when we step out of time into eternity, I believe, the way I understand it is, it'll be like holding a fishing rod. You'll be able to look back on that fishing rod, looking back on time, stretching back some 6,000 years, and you'll be able to see anything that was said or done there that is not covered by a garment or covered by the blood of Jesus. And... We'll be able to find out where those 33,000 emails went. <laughs> we'll be able to find out who was buried in Grant's tomb. Hopefully it was Grant. And big secrets like that. We'll find out about the Watergate tapes. You know, all, all of that we can look back on. But when we look back and when we see what Jesus has done, I see I'm already too early. I'm, I'm already late to start the Bible study. When we see what Jesus has done and when we see here we are standing there in mantles, on our horse in mantles, with our crowns, um, whatever we get to wear for eternity. We see everything that we did, and then we see everything Jesus did. I think we fall on our face, cast our crowns at his feet, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We look back on time and we say, you know what? I didn't do anything. I didn't do it. I absolutely did not do it. Because we can't do anything except we abide in the vine. But we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. So it really is him doing everything to us. All right. So, or for us. Okay. So let's go on to the Bible study. First of all, prayer. Uh, I will freely admit that uh, I, I think this is a good Bible study, but I know who makes it good, and it's the Holy Spirit. And it's not Stan Johnson. It's not all the years I've been studying and doing Bible prophecy and, and all the, the, the Bible studies that I've done. It's not me. It's him. And, and I cast, cast my crowns at his feet right now. So I say, Lord, you said that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. We know that wisdom and might are yours. You change at the times and seasons. You remove the kings and setteth up kings. You give the wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. You reveal it the deep and secret things. You knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with you. And Lord, we know that your word is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will never pass away. And we also know that we cannot understand your word except the Holy Spirit brings revelation to us, opens our eyes, help us to see, know, and understand not only what was said then, but to us today and also into the future. So, Lord, we ask that you would show us the deep and secret things. Show us the deep and secret things in your word and help us to be prepared for your return, be prepared for those things that are coming, be they devastating catastrophes or be they wonderful blessings. We ask that you would keep us in your will, be a lamp into our feet, light into our path, be that voice behind us speaking to us and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. We ask for your anointing on every one of the Bible study, whether it is live or watching the recording. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's uh, get started. I mean, you can do a little bit of cleaning up. I got to get rid of that, I think. Then we go to the Bible. And we're going to be starting tonight 
in Romans chapter 12. That's where we left off. Now, this is really a famous chapter. If you're looking for verses to memorize, there's several of them in this chapter. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to be covering maybe, if you can imagine someone's able to memorize the entire Bible, uh, these these were verses, these chapters here we covered tonight are some of the most famous and some of the best ones to memorize. I remember that when one of my sons was going through, uh, oh my goodness, it was a down in Arizona, uh, a Bible, Bible is like a one year long intensive Bible course. And one of the things they had to do was, uh, was do like so many memory verses. And he called me and said, Dad, what are some good verses I can memorize? And so I sent him a long list of them. Well, I would certainly include a lot of the verses we're covering tonight as top verses to memorize. Okay, so let's get started. We're Romans chapter 12. Hopefully you have your King James Bible right in front of you. Why do you want to have your Bible? Because I, 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 it, it'd take me a minute to go get my, my prophecy Bible. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I should. Maybe maybe one of these times I'll show you. But I have what I call my prophecy Bible, and it's got markings going back, I don't know, since 1987. It's got all my notes in it, all my markings. Uh, so I think it's important that you actually have your paper Bible there so you can make notes in it as you go along. All right, let's get going here. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, brethren, let me try it again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Okay. What did that just say? What does it mean, sacrifice? It means that when it says sacrifice, it means we don't always get our way. It means that we do what we're supposed to do you see, if we call Jesus our Lord, then we're supposed to follow his teachings. As I said before, they call them Buddhists because they follow the teachings of Buddha. They call them Muslims because they follow the teachings in the Quran. But for some reason, Christians think, oh, well, I go to church once in a while. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to, to follow it. I mean, there's, there's no changes in my life. Well, if there are no changes in your life when you got saved, then you better start questioning whether you really got saved. So when it says we're supposed to present our bodies a living sacrifice, meaning that we don't do it our way anymore. If we're calling ourselves a Christian, if we're naming the name of Jesus, that means we're supposed to be following the teachings in the footsteps of Jesus. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now that next word, we really don't like that one. Holy. Look at this. Jump out here and show you. See that word right there? Oh, whoa. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, something happened with the. I don't know if you. Anyway, I hope you can see me. Sean, you better call me if you can't see me. Anyway, so proceed your body's a living sacrifice, holy. No spot, no wrinkle. Unblameable. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable sacrifice. And be not conformed to this world. And what does that mean? It means, brothers and sisters, we don't dress like the world. We don't walk. We don't talk. We don't act like the world. We don't go to the kind of movies the world goes to. We are different. Um, I was just telling my wife the other day, you know, I play racquetball. So I talk about that a lot. And I was telling Leslie the other night, I said, have you seen these new kind of pants that the girl, had? I didn't even get done. She said, yes. Well, I finished my sentence. I said, it, 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 you know, like they, it, 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 I, I didn't know how to explain it. You know I mean? It, they, 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 it's like they put over the spray gun. I mean, and, and I said, it, 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 it goes up the cracks. Okay. I mean, you, you can see all the cracks. She said, yes, I know what you're talking about. And I says, what do they call us? She says, you don't need to know. <laughs> She's right. I don't need to know. And she says, and you don't need to look. I say, no, no. I, you know, you get holy, acceptable. So the world dresses that way. We don't. The world talks that way, but we don't. Um, 
it, it, here's a good test. When you're alone in your bedroom with your husband or your wife and you disagree on something, do the wrong words start slipping out of your mouth? When you're maybe all by yourself, hit your thumb with a hammer or something, do the wrong words come out of your mouth? That's what I'm saying. He says, he says he wants us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. What does that mean? Doesn't mean we cut ourselves <laughs> or kill ourselves a living sacrifice. It means that we've come out of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't look like the world. We don't walk like the way. We don't talk like them. We don't do like them. And if we are ridiculed because of that, then happy are we. So he says, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. I agree. I mean, Jesus died on the cross for us. Isn't it reasonable that we should at least follow what he teaches? And be not conformed to this world. In other words, conformed means like, hmm, how do I say? You know, they have a shrink wrap. When you put two wires together, okay, the two wires come together. Well, you then you twist them together like that, but they have this, this uh, sleeve you can put over that and then you get it hot and that sleeve just shrinks down around that wire. It conforms to the wire. That's what he's saying. He's saying, don't be conformed to this world. Don't, don't look up to Beyonce. I can't believe Christians would go to that. Uh, don't look up to some of these people that are filthy. That, that, that's what they are. They're just filthy. Uh, they get out there and, I mean, it, it's too bad to even talk about it. I mean, it's filthy. Don't idolize them. Don't buy their music. Don't have anything to do with them. Be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed. Now, let's talk about that. See, before we got saved, we walked like the world, talked like the world, act like the world. The world was our friend. And we were a friend of the world. But when we asked Jesus to forgive us, to give us another chance, to wash us clean, we don't want to return to the mud like the sow. We don't want to return to the vomit like the dog. Now, if you've never had a dog, and I got one here three years ago, and I never had, had actually had my dog. Well, boy, it's a different situation when you feed the dog, you think you did good, and then 30 minutes later, the dog is thrown up and you have to shoot the dog away. It's going to go right back over there and eat what it just threw up. And the point there is, if it wasn't any good for you the first time you ate it, then why are you eating it again? And that's what it's saying. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't act like we used to before we got saved. When we ask Jesus said to a heart, it means that we turn around. Repent means turn around. So we were walking the wrong way. We did a 180 turn, and we, we don't have those kind of friends. We don't have those kind of words anymore. We don't do those kind of things. Now, does that mean that the devil has forgotten all about it? Does that mean that he's not ever going to tempt us again? I'll assure you that the devil will continue to tempt you. Whatever you stepped in, he wants you to step in it again. Whatever you put in your mouth that was wrong, he wants you to put it in your mouth again. <laughs> Whatever you touched, he wants you to touch it again. He wants to drag you back to the vomit. He wants to drag you back to the mud. That's where he lives, and he wants to destroy anything that is of God and anything that's righteous. So be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. Means when we accepted Jesus, we don't do those things. We don't watch those, you know, the eye gate, the nose gate, the ear gate, okay, the, 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 hear, the ear gate, the all, all of hear, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, all of that. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good. Now, what does it mean, prove? I would say maybe a better way for us modern Christians to say that you may be walking, that you may become rather than prove, because, you know, good doesn't need any proof, okay? It's, it's, it's there, it's good. What we're saying, but where we can prove that it's in us. Prove what is good and acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Now, summarize that. 
he's saying, don't be the same old way, same old friends. When we got saved, we probably lost some words. We probably lost some habits. We probably lost some friends. I remember at my 50th uh, high school reunion, one of my dirty old friends walked up to me. Hey, you know, I don't know if he read my spirit or if he read the look on my face, but he backed off. He could tell, something's different. This is not the same old sin and stand. Some people that didn't accept me before as a sinner now accepted me. On other case, uh, some people that I walked with in sin, they didn't feel comfortable around me anymore. If if we are if we are having to tell somebody that we're a Christian, then uh, something bugging me here. If we have to tell somebody that we're a Christian. We're late. They, they should know by our walk and our talk. Okay, anyway. Verse 3. For I say, through the grace, grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And that doesn't mean soberly. They're not talking about don't drink. That's a good idea not to drink. But he's saying, in other words, think of yourself humble. He's saying, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. And, I mean, boy, I'd, I'd have to take that one and stick that one on my forehead because when I was, uh, to tell you a little bit of my, my story, when, uh, when I was younger, I think that I just wasn't, I mean, I don't know, maybe they call it attention deficit disorder or whatever, I don't know. I mean, I just wanted to go play. I didn't want to do none of that book stuff. And so when it came to the fourth grade, I remember the phone call. Teacher called my parents, talked to them, discussed it, and they decided Stan was going to stay back in the fourth grade. Most humiliating thing in my life to sit not just in the same room to the same teacher, but in the same desk for the fourth grade repeating. So after that, I decided I was going to start studying. Now, I didn't go to uh, A grades, but I at least started passing. But what it did was put a terrible sense of failure in me. And I said to myself, I'm never going to fail again. Well, when I got out of high school, I discovered that I had a talent and that talent was in sales. Now, looking back, now I realized that it was not for me to make money or to become famous. It was because God had given me that talent so that I could sell Jesus in later days. But I know that yet. So, I started selling heat and smoke detectors door to door. First three weeks, I was number two in the nation. The next month, I was number one in the nation. And I was like a five-time national sales champion. Most of the time, I was the guy winning all the awards that uh, they were having me speak on closing the sale, everything like that. Consequently, I got to thinking, I wish I'd read this. See, but those days, I, yeah, I wasn't going to church. I had not read my Bible. I didn't understand this. I didn't have any grounding to keep me walking the straight and narrow. And so I let this success go to my head. And even to this day, sometime when I go back and watch myself on some of these videos, I think, you know, Stan, that look on your face is like you're mean. <laughs> but I know at the time, I mean, I was not being mean. It's like, okay, I can't help the shape of my face. But I look mean. Uh, other movements I have still have movements that make me appear to be arrogant, to think that I'm better than other people, because I reached the point in my life to where I thought, I'm better than anybody else. <laughs> Looking back is I want to slap that guy and say, fool, stupid, <laughs> kid, what are you thinking? But, but nevertheless... We make those mistakes in life. I wish I'd read this. Not only transformed by the renewing of your mind, and I, there's a bug in here that's about to die. It is flying all around my head. I mean, it's 
<laughs> buzzing me. So, I mean, I got it so good. I got it on my glasses. I got bug spray on my glasses now. So hopefully, hopefully I'll take care of it. Anyway, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. In other words, humbly, correctly, to think soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. What? Okay, well now, some are apostles, some are prophets, some are pastors, teachers, evangelists, and some are intercessors. Some are administrators. Some clean the church. Okay, there's all kinds of different jobs in the church. But uh, one of my favorite things I like to say is in the, the kingdom of God, there's no bench. Nobody gets to sit on the bench. Everybody gets to play in the game. If you're not playing the game, then you're in trouble. You're supposed well, all of us. We're supposed to be in the game. We're supposed to all be playing. So he says, think not of yourselves more highly than you want. Think soberly. According as God had dealt every man the measure of faith, for we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So, I mean, like, for example, okay, I'll talk about my life. Leslie's a prophet. She hears from God, and I do not hear from God on the level that she does. I would even say it this way. No place close. <laughs> she hear, That little lady hears from God. She doesn't say too much. But when she says, God says, everybody listens, everybody knows, God really said. On the other hand, I'm the Bible guy. I'm the guy that memorized the book of Revelation and, you know, I'm the prophecy guy. So when a church were, if, if a church were to call us, and they almost never call us, they don't want to, they don't want to have anything to do with us, at least not yet. But the day's going to come anyway then Leslie would be the one that would stand up and speak for a little while and then give prophecies. And also a prophet is one that brings correction to the body of Christ. And these days in America, the body of Christ needs lots of correction. And if you go back and look at what she said this past Sunday, and if you watch her this Sunday morning on, um, I, think you, I think you can watch it on YouTube, maybe even Facebook. I, I'm talking about Sunday morning in in. And you might even be on prophecyclub.com. I'm not exactly certain, but I know you can watch her. Watch what she said this past week because she's, again, she's talking about error in the church. She's got oh, is it 17 different DVDs on error in the church because there's there's error in the church. Man, or something keeps bugging me. Yeah, <laughs> I hope that thing kills it. Keeps flying around me. All right, anyway. I'm the Bible guy. She's the spirit person. She hears from God by God said. I hear from God because I read the word of God. Okay, so back to what he's saying. For there are many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. In other words, he, he's about to say, so, so one is a hand. You can't say to the hand, you have no need of the foot. Can't say of the, the foot, have no need of the head. All right, so... Each, each person in the body fits there. So we being many are one body, and every one member is uh, one of another. Okay, hang on. i to learn how to do this here. I pushed a button. It made it look a little different. Having been gifts differing according to the grace that is given in us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. I've got a story there. So Prophecy Club started in 1993, and when it started, I started going to Full Gospel Businessmen, and I'm thinking of several stories, which I'll, I'll skip, but one of them was a guy giving personal prophecies. I had never seen this before. Long story short, I invited, uh, I, when I went to Full Gospel Businessman, his name was uh, 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 Gene Oh, man, I forgot his last name. Bacon, Gene Bacon. Great servant of the Lord, great prophet. And this is 1993. Prophecy Club, I think, had started two months before then, but he didn't know it. And so he started prophesying. He says, you're going to do a national ministry. 
you know, you're going to be known for doing meetings and Bible prophecy. And you're going to be thinking, oh, nobody's going to come. Said, yes, they're going to come. They're going to show up. I mean, it was just boom, 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 just like that right down. I mean, he he read our mail for the next two years, the things we were going to do. I'd never seen that. I wanted that. I wanted to be able to bless people. And so I started doing that. In other words, and of course, now today, I've given over 5,000 personal prophecies, as has Leslie. And... It's one of the, the gifts that really all Christians have. But it says here, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. I wanted to prophesy. And I believe also that that goes for all of them, uh, all of the gifts of God, uh, healing and all the rest of them. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. What's he saying? Saying, you know, you, you when you said you wait on it, it doesn't mean you don't do anything. It that the King James there has a, we would use different words today. We don't we wait on the bread to rise. That's the way we think of wait. But what they meant in wait is we serve it. We serve it, we help, we help it to grow, we plant it, we fertilize it, and get it to grow. That's we saw. Let us wait on our ministry. Don't wait, do nothing. In other words, seek after it. Seek after that ministering. Seek after teaching or teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Now, we don't use that word exhorteth much anymore. But we would say today, encourage. So if you find yourself to be an encourager, God bless you. Because especially the days that are coming, it's going to need some encouragers. So he's saying, when let us wait, he's saying, don't let us wait. Instead, let us pursue after it. Let's run after it. Let's try to be better at giving personal prophecies, be better at understanding the Bible, be better at ministering or teaching or encouraging or exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Now, that doesn't mean I don't, don't that doesn't mean something like, well, give them a silver coin because that's more simple than a dollar bill. That's all he's talking about. He's saying. Do it for the right reason, the right way, without trying to bang drums or say, hey, you know, I gave this person some money. Uh, the Bible says in another place, don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. There are times when I have given and um, Leslie would walk back in and say, somebody told me you gave them a big gift. Did you? Because I didn't even tell her. Um, and I think that's the way it's supposed to be. We we don't, because if God sees it in secret, then he will reward us. Or he that exhorteth on, on, on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Now, I had to look that word up. Dissimulation means, oh, I'm going to love this person, but I'm not going to love that person. I'll love you, but I'm not going to love her. He, so he's saying, love everybody. And this next part is a real, really empower, important and powerful part of love. Let love be with that dissimulation. In other words, love everybody. Abhor, that means to, to I don't know, that maybe hate, but be very, avoid, avoid. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave or hold to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Well, okay, what does that mean, preferring one another? It means we ought to prefer to go to church rather than go to the bar. It means that we ought to prefer to spend time with Christians rather than people that are not Christians. It means that if there's a bunch of drinking going on or if there's a bunch of people doing drugs there, we don't go there. And the Holy Spirit will guide us and nudge our heart if we'll listen. Tell us, no, don't, don't go to, don't, don't go there. That's not the right person. Don't have that person as a friend. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another, with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. And it ought to be that Christians get the first job. Because a person ought to know a Christian is going to be smarter, work harder, 
They're going to be the first one there, the last one out. They're going to be the person that's trying to do a good job. I remember my very first job, Gibson's Discount Center. I may have told this story. I know I told it recently someplace. But uh, I got my first job, $1.60 an hour, sacking groceries. Well, we'll hire you for a couple of months, but this is only just through the Christmas rush. Then after the Christmas rush, uh, we'll probably have to lay you off. And I thought, well, that's fine by me. Just uh, I got to have a job. Got to have a job. So I determined that I was going to do the best job I could do. I was going to act like the boss was watching every second. But I wasn't going to turn around to see if he was watching or she was watching. I was just going to do the best I could. And I got to where... I was pretty coordinated. I would pick up a can with one hand. Throw it. I was I was doing like this, and I could flat sack them groceries fast. I double sack when I was supposed to double sack. I held them. I ran them out. I mean, I did. I worked really, really hard. And I thought, well, if they're going to lay me off, they're going to lay off a good worker because I'm going to do it good. But sure enough, after Christmas, they did lay off some people, but I was not one of them. Sure enough, a couple of months later, they said, we want to give you a raise and a promotion. We want to put you out in one of the departments. And then I got a raise and promotion. Matter of fact, in my life, I've never had to go to the boss and ask for a raise. I always worked so hard to where he was afraid he'd lose me. And he gave me a raise. That's the way it's always been. And that's always been my philosophy. I want to work really hard. I'm going to outwork everybody else. I remember, I remember one guy when we were at Gibson's Discount Center again, my, I was working in drug, the drug department. Now that meant my job was to stock toilet paper and pepper towels and canned goods and things like that. And I worked so hard that the guy on the next shift, when I was getting off and I was walking to the time clock to clock out, he had just clocked in and he walked back there and he says, there's nothing for me to do. And I said, yeah, you got a problem. You got eight hours now and you don't have anything to do. I did it all. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I try to do more. There, there's a saying that says you ought to under promise and over deliver. That's what I tried to do. I tried to do more than was expected of me. I called somebody today and the girl says, well, I don't know how to do that. I can tell you if I was working in that company, um, I guess I don't need to tell the whole story. But if I was working in that company, I wouldn't say I don't know how to do that. I would say, I will find out how to do that. And then I would go and get somebody to show me. It's kind of like people in an assembly line, okay? Some people only, like there's a big strike going on with the automakers right now. If I was in the assembly line, I would want to learn to do my job very good. But then in the spare moments, I would want to sneak on down the line and learn that guy's job, and then sneak on down and learn that guy's job. Before long, I'd want to be able to do any of the jobs in that whole line. So if somebody's gone, yeah, I got it. I can do it. I can do that job. I wanted to make myself irreplaceable because I could do anything. That's what it's saying. Not slothful in business. A Christian ought to be the first one there, the last one to leave, the one that wants to do the best job, the one they can count on. They don't have to turn their back. They don't have to worry. They don't have to count the change. They know the change is not gone. They know things are not stolen. It's done right because they're doing it as unto the Lord. Okay, not sloth on business. Fervent in spirit. Fervent. In other words, serious. Like, for example, uh, prayer closet. I can't tell you how many times I've talked about prayer closet, but do you know how many people in our congregation have a prayer closet? I'm afraid to ask. I know two or three have, but I think it might only be two or three. I don't know. But that's fervent. It means serious, on fire, serving the Lord, doing everything we can to build his kingdom, to witness to other people, um, reading our Bible, memorizing the Bible, having a prayer closet. You know, be, being a Christian is... So it's a full-time job. Not sloth in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know, the, the Lord, maybe I'm telling too many stories tonight. <laughs> uh, so God has told me through Leslie 
that he's going to get. Or, or here, I, I think I'm I'll, I'll tell you that story. So, mm, I think I told it though. I'll just tell part of it. So, when I went forward at a full gospel businessman meeting, this would have been about January of 1988. Uh, Charles Doss prayed for me. Part of what he says, he says, put your hands up. He said, the Lord has a special blessing for you, a double blessing. You're going to be a soul winner. You're going to save thousands upon thousands. The Lord wants you to know that all of your sins are forgiven. Well, Leslie had another dream seven or eight years ago and said, tell Stan that if he's going to save thousands on thousands, he needs to fish and not only the salt water, but also in the fresh water. Now, what does that mean? Well, what kind of fish would you find in the salt water? Because the Christians are the salt, see? So what he was saying is, yes, you need to advertise among the Christians, but you also need to advertise among the sinners. You need also reach out. So he's, in that. I prayed, I said, Lord, I'd like to have three times more, three times more souls than what you've already said you're going to give me. So we want to always be serving the Lord. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, rejoicing in hope. We need that, especially as prophecy students. Patient in tribulation. Now, that doesn't, that's not talking about the seven-year tribulation. It's saying be patient when things are not going your way. Don't just throw a temper tantrum. Don't get mad. Don't go breaking things. Uh, someone sent me a video of some guy in a Walmart that had taken a hammer into Walmart and just busting up everything he could. Uh, not Christian. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in help, patient tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. I asked Leslie the other day, I said, are you praying enough? She looked at me like, are you serious? You're asking me if I pray enough? It was like, <laughs> okay, I guess you do. <laughs> because when we're walking with the Lord, we're always praying. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, I walk the dog and I, I'm, I'm out there praying. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And, and, and forgive me for all the times that I forgot to thank you. Forgive me for the times that I thought I did something when I didn't do it. It was your hand the whole time. So we're always in prayer. We're always talking to the Lord. I remember Michael Bolde said that of Demetri Doom. He says, he's always talking to God. That's the way it is. We have a relationship with him. Distributing to the necessity of saints. So it means that when someone is a Christian and they're around you, if there's a way for you to help them, it means that we do. We help those. If there's a possible way we can't help them, we do. Given hospitality to helping people, um, showing up early and just, Finding something to do and do it. I mean, at the church or with the people in the church. You know, uh, some people go to church to get ministered to. But it should be that a lot of people go to church to be a minister. Some people go to church because they need help. Others go to church to give the help. But see, a church should be a place to where people are coming together and working together and helping each other. That's what it's saying. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, give it to hospitality, and bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low the low estate. What does that mean? It means that if they're hurting, you hurt. If they're rejoicing, you rejoice with them. If they're needing some encouragement, you give them some encouragement. If they're needing some help and you can help them, you help them. Help them best way you can, right? Be not wise in your own conceits. Comes back to the same thing. Don't think of yourself more highly than we ought. Recompense no man evil for evil. Now, what's recompense? It means like the, I think it was a Chinese proverb that says, when you are going out for revenge, first dig two graves, one for you and one for the other person. 
It's saying don't have, don't take revenge. If someone does wrong for you, turn the other cheek. That means that we don't necessarily, we're not trying to get even. And we understand that people are going to do wrong things to us. And we should be standing ready to forgive. And as a pastor, I'm going to say, I am appalled at some of the people that have left our congregation that did not forgive. And I'm not talking about necessarily something Leslie or I did to them, but maybe one of the other congregations members did something wrong and they got all upset about it and left the church. Where's the forgiveness? Recompense to no man evil for evil. We need to be quick to forgive. Bible says that if we don't forgive, then neither will Jesus forgive us. Now, I'll look at it like this. Since I make so many mistakes, man, I need all the forgiveness I can get. So since I need a lot of forgiveness, I better be handing out forgiveness a lot. Recompense. To, you see what I'm saying? These are great memory verses. These are verses to write down and put, hang them up on the wall. These are ways we live as Christians. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Nobody should have to have a video camera on us as we're working. You hear, you call these places and you see, well, now this telephone conversation is going to be recorded for quality. Are they recording it for my end or they're recording it for their end? Well, a Christian shouldn't have to be recorded. A Christian should be simply trying to do the very best they possibly can. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That's a famous memory verse right there. Live peaceably with all men. As much as we possibly can, get along. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. See, they have these... Uh, cartoon characters, the Avengers. Well, see, that's that's against those Christian principles because the Bible's about to say here in just a second that Jesus is the righteous judge and he will do all of the avenging that we're not supposed to be Avengers. We're not supposed to be trying to dish out what somebody else has handed to us. We're supposed to be forgiving, long-suffering, Gentle. Not, okay, let's go on. Recompense no evil. Okay, I read that. Dearly, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Now, that sounds like you're supposed to get mad. No, what are you saying? But rather give place unto the wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will replay, repay. So he's saying, don't get mad. Don't get upset. Be quick to forgive. Kind, gentle, easily entreated, the Bible says in another place. Therefore, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. What? If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And not that we're doing it, it's just that Jesus will see that we did it right. Be not overcome of evil. Instead, Overcome evil with good. So when someone is mean to you, don't be, don't be mean back. If someone does something wrong, don't do it back. If someone stabs you in the back, don't stab them in the back. Instead, forgive them. And then later on down the road and they're down and they're hurting and you turn around and help them. A lot of times that, that person will become our biggest friend because when it was our turn to hit them, we didn't hit them. Instead, we helped them. We gave them the drink. We gave them the help, whatever it was. Now, we're going to go to chapter, chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be or, or are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works. Now, I've got to read several of this to, to, to explain this to you. 
For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So this is actually talking about rulers. So it's giving us advice concerning rulers. For rulers are not a terror to good works. Now, the way we would say it today, rulers, whatever the nation, whatever the religion, whatever the law is there, in most cases, if you do good, they're not going to be against you. So the rulers are not terror. They're not mad. They're not, they, they don't beat those people that do good works. That's the way we would say it today. But to that evil, in other words, the rulers don't punish people for doing good. They punish people for doing evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. No matter what nation, no matter what language, if we do good, then we get praise. If we don't do good, then we get in trouble. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. What's he talking about? He's talking about these rulers here. These rulers are watching over to see that good works are done. So he says, if you have praise of, uh, if you do good, you have praise of them. For he is the minister of God. What? Even if they're not Christians, but they are rulers, maybe in another nation speaking another language. <clears throat> But they are, we find it again here. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, then you better be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God. So even if we were to go to another country, we're about to go to Honduras here in a couple of weeks to minister there. Which, by the way, I'm supposed to tell you, I think it's for the old man. I'm going to write down the dates. I think it's October the 6th, and then the following Friday won't be a Bible study because they'll be in Honduras. But what he's saying is even if you go to another country, the rulers there still want you to do good. If you do good, you're rewarded of it. If you do bad, then it is his job for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's a, a given. Whatever nation, whatever language. Now, they may have different laws, but at the end of the day, there are a few laws that doesn't make any difference uh, what nation, what language. They, there's, there's still people wanting you to do good. If you do good, then you're in good shape. If you don't do good, then there's someone there to hit you. Something. That's what it's saying. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, we don't just do it because we're made to do it. We do it because we want to do it. We want to do the right thing. Because when we have Jesus in our heart, we want to do the right things. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So we go to another country. That person's got a badge. Then we give them honor. We might not agree with their God but we're still going to give them honor. And when there are tributes that we have to pay, going through airports and things like that, then we, we do things that are right, but because we're doing it under the Lord. Oh, no man, anything. Now, I'm going to show you that this is one of the often misunderstood verses. A lot of people say, They'll quote that. Oh, oh, no man, anything. Oh, well, that means I'm not supposed to ever take out a loan. That's not what it's talking about. Oh, that means I'm not supposed to, if I can't buy my car, pay cash. If I can't pay cash for my house, I'm not supposed to get a loan. That's not what it's saying. Oh, no man, anything, but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Hang on. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. <coughs> thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, he wasn't talking about finances there, was he? He's talking about own no man anything. He's saying that when someone has done good to you, do good back. Don't go around making other people do good to you, do good to you, do good to you, do good to you. That way you're owing a lot of people to keep it even. He's saying, be good, do good, do good things. 
try to do the right thing. And it's it's not everything is in the Bible. We don't. If someone comes over and helps you chop weeds, go help them chop weeds. If someone's going to come and help you with your field, there'll be a time when you can go and help them help them. Maybe you see they need help with their your their field, and they that you just you go help them anyway. And and we do that not looking back behind us for them to repay at all. Bible says that when we lend, hope not hope for nothing in return. That way God is required, he says. I don't think that's the right word, but then God will repay us. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. So there's an occasion where you're in a position to where you are are here. I'll give you an example. So I got a bill uh, for my water and it was really high. And I I, 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 I looked at it that that's not right. So I called and said, yeah, that's right. Well, apparently that they had changed the way they build things. And I think that there was a person in the wrong position that made the decision to change the billing ways and, excuse me, and they didn't do it the right way. And they thought, oh, well, you know, we can charge this person this much and we can charge this person this much more. And so in this case, he's saying that we should look to see that everybody, whether our neighbor or not, is treated fairly. That's basic. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, Love is the fulfilling of the law. If we love them, if we help them, the people around about us, we do good to them, then we have fulfilled the law in most cases. And that knowing the time, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Yeah, well, (laughs) we're the last generation. I'm pretty convinced that most people are. But again, they've been convinced of that for several hundred years now and it didn't happen anyway the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the arm of light it's simply saying the what he's been talking about for the last chapter and a half now is basically love your neighbor as yourself if you have a way to do good to a person then do good to that person that's what he's saying the night is far spent the way we'd say it today is you know, we're getting really close to that 2,000-year mark, and a lot of people are saying Jesus is going to come back in 2028, 2029, 2030, I don't know, someplace, and then we don't know exactly yet, but we're pretty sure it's pretty close. That's the way we would say it today. So let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Now, let me jump up here. I have to uh, do this, and then I do this. And then push 10. Let me show you what this chambering. I looked it up once before. A place for laying down. So it's saying, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in fussing and fighting and arguing all the time or in drunkenness. We know what that is, alcohol. But in chambering, the way we would say that is, is don't sleep too much. Don't refuse to work. Don't refuse to have a job. Things like that. Wantonness. Okay, let's look up wantonness. <laughs> Uh, unbridled lust. Uh, we call that today, um, what do we call that? In other words, people that work and work and work, and maybe they're even rich, maybe they're really, really rich, but the one thing they want is more money. He's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Not in strife and envy. Don't fuss. Don't fight. Don't be an arguer. Don't be a backbiter. Love and help. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that we should try to walk like him, talk like him, love like him, preach like him, encourage people like him. We should try to walk the footsteps of Jesus. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time here. Oh, man. In this different view I clicked here. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I think we got enough time to do another chapter. So now we're in chapter 14. Let's jump to here we go. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. 
Okay, so some people just got saved and they don't understand a lot of these things, which is why we're doing the Bible study here tonight, including me. I'm still learning myself. Matter of fact, the reason, the reason I'm doing the Bible study more than anything is because I need it because my bucket has a hole in it. And I think your bucket has a hole in it. And that is, it doesn't make any difference what we put in it. It's eventually going to all leak out if we don't refresh it. With the Bible, we have to continually keep reading it and reading it and reading it. And I met one guy and he said he made a commitment to the Lord years ago to read through the Bible once every year. That's a very good commitment, a very good thing to do. Him that is weak in the faith or not knowing the Bible too much or not knowing the way of Christians too much, receive him, help him. But not too doubtful disputations. In other words, don't don't beat them up. Don't be doubtful about them. Help them. Help them. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats only herbs. Now, here's what he's about to say. So if somebody comes in, they're a vegetarian, don't beat on them because they're a vegetarian. Or somebody comes in and they eat shrimp or they eat pig or whatever, you know, I don't. Well, I eat shrimp, uh, but I try not to eat any pork. Uh, very, very, very rarely. But he's saying don't beat them up. That's what he's about to say. Who art thou that judgest of the man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he should be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth another day of alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Basically, you know, give him some space. Give him some room. Don't necessarily think everybody's got to walk like you stand, talk like you stand, cut their hair like you stand, you know, okay. give, them, give them some room. There's different people. Got to put up with some of those people have mustache because they have a great big lip. Okay, got to put up with it. <laughs> he that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. He's just saying, give them a break. Give them some room. Don't expect everybody to be like us. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. And to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? And that's what he's basically saying. Don't judge people. You know, give, give them room to live their life the way they want to, as long as they're not sinning. You understand? Or what dost thou set and not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, written as I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not, therefore, judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, what is that? I remember... many years ago, when we first started celebrating the uh, Passover. And when we were in Israel, they gave us this uh, wine, they call it the hammer. It's a red sweet wine and it tasted really good. And they said, the reason we call it a hammer is because it hits you like a hammer. You cannot hold your eyes open. He said, that's the reason they believe the two guys that were supposed to be praying with Jesus couldn't keep their eyes open because they probably had the hammer, the sweet wine of Israel at the Passover. But anyway, so this, we decided we were going to actually have wine at the Passover. And when we handed that wine out, I remember setting the glass down in front of the congregation members. He was a new Christian and you could tell, I, I could tell the way he looked at that wine. It was like, no, no, I, 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 I shouldn't drink that. I, that thing got a hold of me. That was a snake in my life, and and I, I could see it was a stumbling block to him. And so I said, you know what? Uh, let's don't do that. So I picked up the wine. He was actually glad because it was, you know, some people can take a drink, 
and it's not a problem. Some people take one, one drink and they can't stop. And what I saw in this guy's eyes, what I saw in this guy's spirit was he was one of them that couldn't stop. That's a stumbling block. Don't, uh, ladies, don't dress like you want some man to come up and ask your phone number. That's the nicest way I can put it. Um, that's a stumbling block. I, I think a lot of women, the way they dress, are stumbling blocks. I look around the men, you know, we do, at least at the gym, you know, we're just wearing old sloppy loose clothes, you know. We're just, you know, there to sweat. But that's not the way it is with a lot of ladies. They are hooks. I have to turn my head often. Stumbling block. Sometimes there's stumbling blocks to people that eat. Um, say their favorite food is ice cream. You probably don't want, there. it might be a person you don't want to be eating ice cream in front of them. That's what I'm saying. So we don't want to put stumbling blocks in front of them. That's what he's talking about. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in these brothers' way. I know, and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him is unclean. Now, let me say something about that. There are some things in the Bible back in the Old Testament that they were forbidden to eat. And the Bible says that they're not an abomination before God. In other words, if you want to eat pig, not going to bother God. But there should be an abomination to us. In other words, it's not good. Because, for example, pigs or pork, they are the vacuum cleaners of the earth. Whatever dies, that's a pig's job is to find it and eat it. And so if you eat that, then a good possibility, whatever killed whatever killed, whatever killed, whatever killed, that the pig has been eating all of its life, good possibility it's going to kill you too. Same thing with catfish. They are the vacuum cleaners of the lake. So whatever is on the bottom of the lake, uh, other dead fish and dead and fish poop and stuff, that's what a catfish eats. So when we pull up a catfish and we eat it, it's an abomination to us. In other words, it's saying it's a very dangerous thing to eat and you can get sick from it. I remember my mom, uh, one time we went to Red Lobster and she had clams and she got home that night. She said, I thought I was never going to stop throwing up from, she got something from the clams. Now, of course, if it was theoretically, if it was cooked enough, there shouldn't have been anything that would hurt her theoretically. But she said, I got sick uh, well, as a dog of those clams. So I'm only saying that what he's saying is, it's not wrong before God. You can eat anything you want, but it should be an abomination to us. We don't want to eat things that will shorten our life, that will get us sick. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, unclean is clean. Okay, let's go on to the next one. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him, with thy meat for whom Christ died. Okay, now let's let's say, for example, you go to a party and they have shrimp out, and you're convinced that shrimp should not be eaten, cold, cooked, or any other manner. And so that's the only thing to eat. And the host of the meeting offer or the, of the party offers you some shrimp. What he's saying is if it's going to offend them then he's saying, eat the shrimp. But on the other hand, we shouldn't offend those people by offering the shrimp in the first place. I know it's complicated, but he's saying he's more, what, what he's really trying to say is don't offend. Try not to offend more than the thing that we eat or we don't eat. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Did you catch that? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. In other words, it's not what we eat or drink as much as the way we treat each other. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that, by the way, I should also say that when we drink, uh, I do not think it was an apple that Adam and Eve ate. I think it was a grape. I've done research, and in the King James Bible, I think apple is found eight times, and not one thing is written in the Bible bad about an apple. 
But if you'll do research on grapes, wine, wine press, uh, you'll find, I think it was like 350 scriptures where wine is pretty much the single worst thing in the Bible. Uh, I mean, what was it that got Noah in trouble? Got drunk on wine. He didn't know that it had fermented because it was after the flood and apparently before the flood, it didn't spoil. And so it, it didn't ferment, didn't make him drunk. But he made some wine afterwards and made him drunk. He didn't know it was going to make him drunk. And then, of course, his, one of his children, um, I forget which one, Seth, I think it was. Anyway, one of his children had sex with him, apparently. And boy, there's a lot of problem came from that. Anyway, not for the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. That's not saying it's okay to drink alcohol. I know there's another place where Paul says it's good to drink wine because it's good for your stomach. Well, I myself, I, yeah, and, and let, let me talk about this. If you can drink alcohol, one drink or one sip and put it down, walk it away, it doesn't bother you, and you're not tempted, or you're not drawn to it again, then maybe it's okay. But if you can't just drink one, then you should not drink one. That's, that's the way I feel about it. And in my particular case, my dad was, a, a, I think he, he was a drunk before he met my mom. He was not a Christian before he met my mom, but my mom wouldn't have anything to do with him unless he accepted Jesus and stopped his drinking. And in all the time I was around my dad, I saw him drink one beer. That's all I can remember seeing him ever drink. I, yeah, I, I believe that's correct. Now, but I, I believe that he had the hook. My uncle, they say, was a drunk. Um, I forget who it was. There was another. Oh, my brother, my younger brother, was not only drunk, but he was uh, into marijuana big time. And then he decided to clean his life up, accepted Jesus. He now has a church. He started a church. He's a pastor of a church now up in the Spokane, Washington area. But I believe that I have a hook. I think I've inherited that hook. And I can feel if I drink some kind of alcohol, I mean, it's like the Holy Spirit is telling me, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, don't do that. It'll get you in trouble. I, let, me, let me tell you another story. So this was 10 years ago. Leslie says, I need you to stop by and get me some rum. I'm going to make a rum cake tonight for Christmas. Stop by. Yeah, you know, go into a liquor store and get me some, some rum. I don't think I've ever been in a liquor store before. First time I ever went to a liquor store. So I stopped, went into a liquor store. Man, I, you know, <laughs> nothing but bottles of liquor every place. And I remember from back in my drinking days, which was back in the, what was that, 80s? Yeah. Uh, I used to like Johnny Walker Black. And I heard somebody say, boy, have you ever tasted Johnny Walker Green, I think it was. The Green Label. No, no. Well, have you ever get a chance? Taste that because, boy, that's, that is really, really good. So right next to the rum, I got a bottle of rum for Leslie for her, her cake. There was also a bottle of Johnny Walker Green Label. And I thought, oh, I got to try that. So I took it home. I poured it into a glass. And I, you know, how you do it. And I thought, boy, that, that is, you know, I, I like it with water. as That is really good. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, Stan, if you drink that, if you even allow that bottle to stay in your house overnight, you will get a demon and you will become a drunk and you will lose your ministry and you will never do all of the things I promised for you to do. I recognize the voice of the Lord on that. So I went over and I got that bottle and I took the cap off and I poured it right down the sink. Wife the next day says, hey, what happened? Why you didn't you buy two bottles? Yes, I did. Where's the other one? 
I sits there in the trash. I told her the story. Now, I just had my 70th uh, birthday, and my wife gets her hair done, you know, as all ladies do. And the lady that does her hair sent a gift with Leslie for me. So she got to home and birthday rolled around. I opened the gift and I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, what, what was it? Let me think. It, some kind of alcohol. I opened it up. And I kind of chuckled. And I, it, oh, I could, I could, I could hear the devil talking. Oh, Stan. Oh, it's really good. You're going to really like it. Go ahead. Taste it. But then the Lord reminded me, Stan, you remember what I said? You let that bottle stay in your house overnight. You open it. And you will become a drunk. You will never do what I've promised you that you're going to do. So I walked over and I opened it up. And I smelled it. And I could smell the spirit in there. I could smell the devil in there. And I opened it up and poured it right down the toilet. Flushed the toilet. Walked out and threw it in the trash. Box, glasses, everything. Some people can take a sip and it doesn't bother them. I don't believe I'm one. And here's the thing. I think it's better not to find out. We have this couple that just, just, I mean, this is like their second time to come to our church. And uh, we met out at the park. Let me think. It, no, 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 no. It wasn't a church event. It was one of the... Anyway, it, it, they, they, had, they had beer there. And of course, it wasn't church and everything. But they, they had beer there. And uh, this man's wife, said, well, I've, I've never I've never tasted anything alcohol. What does tequila taste like? And I, was, I said, I don't think you want to even try it. So I talked her out of ever trying it. That's really the best thing to do as far as alcohol and drugs. I mean, I've, I've never smoked marijuana or done any of those drugs, none of that stuff. The best thing to do is not to take the first puff. The best thing to do is don't take the first drink. The best thing to do is don't hop in the sack with the girl until she's wearing your ring. Don't do that. Do it right. I know today, you know, you got to sleep with them. You got to try it out. You know, you got to make sure that it's good. No, you don't. What you have to do is hear from the Holy Spirit. Is this the one? Now, I didn't do that. I made lots and lots and lots of mistakes, but boy, have I repented. If I could live my life over again, I would not do some of those things. All right, let's, let's get back to the, the message here. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Don't cause people to stumble. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the worth of God. All things indeed are pure. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Same thing, drink. Same thing smoking, same thing taking a drug. Okay, now if, if it offends somebody, don't do it. And if it offends your body, don't do it. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, for is offended or is made weak. If, in other words, if you think a person's an alcoholic, don't offer him a drink. If you think that a person can't say no to another dip of ice cream or another pie, don't offer them another piece of pie. Or in other words, don't, don't, don't try to get them to walk down the wrong path. That's what he's saying. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. 
In other words, walk what you preaching, boy. <laughs> if you preach to not drink, then don't be drinking. So I don't drink. And he that doubleth is damned. Try it again here. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. <coughs> okay, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Well, we will start up with 15 next week. If uh, or excuse me, that's not next week. Matter of fact, I, I need let me let me look at a calendar here. I think she said calendar, calendar, calendar. Well, any other time I'd be able to spot the calendar real quick. Okay, here we go. I know that I leave. I don't ever look at this calendar. Look at this calendar down here, but I'm afraid to touch a button and it might mess it up. I know I leave October the 5th and I come back, I think it is on the 17th. So I won't be able to do two Bible studies from the 5th to the 17th, whatever those dates are. September, October. Okay, here we go. I got, I got a calendar. 6 and 13. October 6 and 13, no Bible study. Um, also, I guess I should probably say <sighs> let me click this. So, <clears throat> what happened with Berkey? It's come out now in the news, so I think I can go ahead and talk about it. So, the EPA realized that the Berkey water filter could kill COVID, kill viruses, because they impregnate the filter with silver. Why? So that the, the garbage that it filters out wouldn't start to mold and mildew in the filter. So the filter lasts longer and works better with a little bit of silver in it. Well, the EPA didn't like that. I think that they were looking for some reason to take them off the market, in my opinion. And so they have told them to have a cease and desist. Now, yes, Berkey's filed a countersuit. They're trying to remove this. And if there's righteousness done in America, then no harm will come to Berkey. But the problem is, I think that they're, so they say the prophets, that they plan on releasing another virus, possibly later on this year or next year. And I think that they want to get rid of the Berkey water filters because they know the Berkey water filters can filter out the garbage they want to put in our water, bottom line. So here's what happened. Long about uh, Thursday of last week, maybe even a uh, little back up, about Tuesday or Wednesday, Sean, my son, called and said, Dad, you know, we got a big inventory of these Berkeys and uh, things are kind of getting tight financially. Why don't you talk about the Berkeys again? I said, well, actually, I've got some things coming up in the news. So, yeah, that, that would fit. So we talked about the Berkeys. And like two days later, all of a sudden we get starting in deluge with orders for Berkeys. What's going on? Well, that's when we found out that Berkey was being closed down by the EPA. So, <laughs> I mean, like in mean, uh, 24 hours, we sold out of Berkey's and we had a large inventory. But it's not about making money. It's about getting people what they need. And I want to get a lot of Berkey's to people. So we, uh, we called Berkey, said, okay, can we order some more? Yes. And I said, but it'll be three. It, they, then they said it'd be two to three weeks for delivery. Now, normally, because we're in the same area as where the warehouse is, Normally, it's a couple of days and we get our inventory. But they said, <laughs> where are you out locally? It'll be two to three weeks, but yes, you can place an order. So we placed a, a large order. And here's the problem. When we place an order, they make us pay for it in advance. As you can imagine, that's the way it does. That's the way it works. And so we took all of the money and the extra money, the, the, the uh, emergency money. We bought Berkey water filters. I went on, I said, okay, this is the deal. Do you want a Berkey water filter? We are out right now. We've got some more coming. Well, <laughs> those sold out the next day. So then I, I called, or frankly, just telling you exactly what happened. I called a couple of friends. I said, look, at, I, 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 I need eight to $10,000. And I need it like 
today because I need to buy some more breaking water filters because they're about to be gone and I, I want our people to be able to get them. Okay, long story short, uh, I got eh, six or seven thousand dollars from, from a total of several people. So we bought some more Berkey water filters. Well, now we're back in that same position. We need to buy some more Berkey water filters. Uh, we've, we've got some on the way, but by the time they get here, we already, matter of fact, we're, we're already out of most of them. We were to calculate it that by the time they get here, they'll all be sold. So I guess what I'm saying is if you folks out there in Bible study land, God has blessed you and you can help us. Now would be a really good time. We really, really, we need $10,000. We need, we need to put $10,000 in Berkey's. Whatever you can help would be really, really appreciated. In addition, Jason Meeks, one of Leslie's prophets, had a dream. And he was told in the dream that it would be very important to start asking people to become members of the Prophecy Club. And the way you do that is just go to prophecyclub.com. I don't know, there might be a QR code you're looking at here where uh, you can join at $9.90 a month or more. And most people do more than that on an automatic payment so that we have like a base so that uh, when, the, when the trouble hits, financial trouble hits, we're going to be able to smooth through that and make it through it. Uh, got a lot of things we need to do for the Lord. And so the Prophecy Club has blessed you and you can help us uh, with as much as you can help us. Now would be a really, really, really good time. How are we doing on time? Okay. So let me end with a prayer. Dear Holy Father, it is our privilege in a nation where we can gather either in person or online to read and study your Bible. No one's going to be knocking on our door, confiscating our Bible, arresting us. It's our privilege. And we thank you that we can read and study your Bible in peace. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit comes in and shows us and teaches us all things. Lord, I also ask you to bless the people out there that are watching. Help them to understand the Bible. Some of them are in need. I ask you to take care of those needs. Some of them are needing financial or health or family or job, whatever that need is, Lord, I ask you to help them to take care of that need. I also ask that you get them to be prepared mentally, spiritually, financially, to be able to weather the storm that we're all about to go through. And that when the storm hits, they're prepared, they're strong mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and that they are able to minister others and that they will be walking in the sevenfold miracles. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Let me jump over here. Let me see if I've got any quick questions here. I see I've got... Okay, here's a question. Do you have any opinion on October the 4th of this year that 5G is supposed to have a signal from the federal government sent to everyone's phone to control them? Okay. I'll tell you what I think. I believe real raw news. I'll say it again. I believe real raw news. And two or three weeks ago, <clears throat> they had an article out there talking about this. And basically, the, the bad guys have taken back over the control of the EBS signal. That's what you're talking about. And the white hat guys are putting their phones in these uh, signal blocking bags. So I immediately ordered some signal blocking bags and I'll have to look it up. But I think it's like two o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. And about an hour before and an hour after that's supposed to happen, Leslie and I are going to put our two cell phones. She also has one of those iPads uh, and we're going to put them all in a signal blocking bag because I don't trust these evil people in high places. I don't know what they're going to do but I would prefer them not be able to reach our phones. Who knows? Maybe they put some kind of a tracking program in there. I don't know. They track us anyway. I don't know. I just don't trust them. So that's what I plan to do. I plan to have our cell phones and Leslie's iPad blocked. 
for an hour before and an hour after that time. Go to realrawnews.com and read up on it. Read up on it. God bless you. Thank you. And it is time to close the Bible study. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you are looking forward to the return of Jesus.